in preparation to launch both the next uh, real event in which the World Quantum Day will be uh, publicly announced. So uh, this event is to launch the next one, both to prepare for 2025, where there are plans to make it the uh, quantum century. Uh, because most of quantum mechanics, the most important uh, discoveries and uh, uh, research came out exactly more or less in 1925. So thank you and I'm happy to uh, see you all attending. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tony Apollora, for that very short introduction. Now we are going to have Professor Andrzej Schwierek, who is, as I said, the head of the Department of Physics, and he's going to, his title is going to be Fun and Adventures in a Quantum World. So the floor is yours. Hi, hi. Just making sure that everyone can hear me. Are we okay? Would you? Um, hi, everyone. Um, please let's just uh, drop the titles. I'm, I'm Andre. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us. It's, it's uh, actually a surprising number of people here. Um, I also want to give a shout out uh, to one of our honorary group members, uh, is Noel Faruja, who is actually a, a, um, a software developer by training, and he's he's joined us on a on a couple of projects. Uh, Daniel, we haven't even met yet, so don't worry, it's not your fault, it's fine. Um, so um, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us. I mean, it's 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 a really um, it's a, it's a real big pleasure to uh, to be able to participate in this, also because you know. Quantum and Malta only started very recently, so so it's nice to see that we're we're we we are now attracting the attention even of uh, uh, gadgets and Maltese meme makers, thanks to thanks to uh, my, my student, our student uh, Jake. Um, right. So I I wanted to give um, a very kind of uh, high level brief introduction to what it is that we care about. So what it is that this group cares about. And I'm not going to give any details. I'm not going to give anything, um, um, anything mathematical or anything. I'm just going to show a few pictures and kind of talk a bit about them. But of course, I'm happy to answer any questions, happy to discuss anything which you'd like to discuss um, later, either in the Q&A or just get in touch with us. And I'm very happy to discuss. So I am going to try and share my screen. So bear with me for a second. Um, can one of the guys just start? confirm that I am sharing screen. Yeah, fantastic, thanks. Okay, so first of all, before I kick off, um, for those of you who don't know uh, or don't know us as a group, um, just visit our website at uh, quantum.edu.mt. There's uh, who we are, what we do, uh, publications, um, things like that. And basically uh, you, can, you, can, you can keep in, uh, keep updated with all our latest exploits and interesting things. We've got a Twitter feed and everything else. Uh, so please, Go over there if you want to hear more about, want to read more about our group and our our exploits. Having said that, let's talk about let's talk about quantum mechanics. Now, in in the world around us, um, sort of, I say the world of ordinary objects, the world we are used to living in and interacting with ever since we're toddlers and you know, all the way up, uh, there's kind of um, Two different kinds of objects that we interact with. Um, if I were, if I were to simpl oversimplify, one is what we physicists would call particles. So particles are very much like like a, a football, like a ball. You know, we can we can point at the particle, and the particle is moving in a certain direction at a certain speed. And you know, we we have this image of particles as 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 billiard balls and or footballs moving around we can hit them we can move them we can do things with them and it's just it 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 it's something we are used to doing ever since we're we're children and it's you know we know how how the world of particles works now these objects are one class a second class of objects is waves now we are not used to uh, Treating waves as particles because they they behave very differently. And of course, if I if I point at this picture here, you know, I cannot really point at uh, anywhere in the picture and say, well, the wave is here or the wave is there. You know, the wave is kind of everywhere in the picture. Um, yes, it is moving in a certain direction, but but even then, one can uh, one can come up, one can see you know circular waves which are spreading in many different directions at the same time. So. We have these two different classes of objects, which we are used to dealing with, used to working with, and we feel very at home with. So, you know, objects like footballs, particles, and objects like waves, which are well, waves. 
Now, waves behave a bit differently, as I was saying to, to, to particles. So for example, this is a lovely picture, which I just found about 15 minutes ago, where we see water waves passing through a, a a breakwater. I have no idea where, where on earth this is, but this is an actual photo. And, and you see the water wave kind of passes through and then starts spreading out in a circular fashion. Um, now, this is something which many of us who've been, who been who like walking across the, uh, the um, along the bastions of Valletta. So you know, we, we, we see these phenomena every day and we actually grow up with them here on, on here in Malta. So it's something which is familiar to us. Um, but it's it's nice seeing uh, nice seeing it from 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 a plane. You can really see you can really see the waves spreading out. Now, what I what I wanted to uh, take from this is, well, this phenomenon is something which we call diffraction. Now, there is a point to this, and there is a reason why I'm bringing all of this up. Okay, so just bear with me until I kind of define the terms. When we have waves which hit a barrier they kind of spread out and move in a very different way. So we, 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 you know, the waves which are coming in, say in a straight line, suddenly start turning circular and they spread out. And if we have many such holes in a barrier, all these waves will, will spread out and start interacting with each other. And they form this very interesting pattern, which we call an interference pattern. And if I were to emphasize the contrast a bit, you can see quite clearly how how this uh, interference pattern consists of places which uh, which in this picture are bright and dark, which 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 refer to the waves being uh, well high high amplitude or low. Um, and actually, if we take a cut through this picture, um, what we would see would be this pattern of um, bright and dark spots or, 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 or waves being very strong and waves being weak. And this is something which, uh, well, we're seeing here with water, but we can actually also see it with many other things. Um, for example, we can replicate exactly the same experiment with light. This is called Young's double slit experiment. So if we pass light through two holes, what comes out at the end is not just two spots, but it's this weird pattern of bright and dark spots, pretty much in the same way as the water waves, which I just showed. Now, the curious thing is that this isn't limited to things which we traditionally call waves, like light, perhaps, or water. It turns out that it also applies to other things. Now, in order to explain how bizarre this is, let me kind of uh, run you through a, a thought experiment. Imagine we had a wall with two holes in it and a football, an ordinary football, you know, the kind of thing which we play with. And we kick the football through, uh, uh, kick it at the wall. The football will either pass through one of the holes or the other, or none, of course. But if it passes through the, through the wall, uh, through the holes, it will pass through one or through the other. And that's it, you know. So at the end, after the wall, we will find some balls in one place on the left, say, some balls on the right, and that's it. Now, if we do exactly the same thing, but shrink it down by uh, about a million times, we can actually replicate exactly the same experiment, where instead of an ordinary football, we have something, for example, called a uh, buckyball, a Buckminster Fuller ring, which is basically a small molecule, which happens to have exactly the same shape as a football. And we can fire this, this molecular football at a barrier. And now the question is, do we see exactly the same thing? Do we see that the molecule goes through one, slit or the other, and that's it. Not really. It actually turns out that when we do this with molecules, with uh, electrons, with many other things, what we see is exactly the same pattern as we saw with water waves and with, with light. So this is a picture of electrons passing through uh, two slits. This is a picture of what happens when we have these footballs, these buckyballs passing through two slits. We see this, this interesting pattern of bright and dark spots. And, and what, I want to, what I want to draw from all of this is that when we start looking at smaller things, at, at, at the world, at the universe, at the small scale, we start seeing these behaviors like things being in two places at the same time, which is what this is. This is a photo of something which was in two places at the same time, um, which, are, which don't correspond to our ordinary experience. And 
part of what we do in this group is, is to try and understand why the universe seems to behave differently at different scales. Uh, so why does it behave differently for small objects with respect to large objects? So that's the more fundamental, the more um, basic science uh, oriented part of our work. Then we also get these ideas and see how we can apply them to create new technologies like one computers, which promise to be something like super fast computers. And the reason that they, they're super fast, the reason that they work so much better is because they, because they can exploit these weird properties of nature, like something being in two places at the same time. And by exploiting these properties of nature, they can work out problems, they work, they work things out in a way which cannot be done using ordinary devices, ordinary computers, ordinary technologies. So, so, so we, we work on both fronts, you know, having an eye on what is uh, what what makes the world interesting and trying to understand that and at the same time exploiting this to create to create new technologies this is this is all i wanted to say i'm well over time um i hope i hope i managed to give you a flavor of what it is that we we talk about um of course the rest of the group will uh, will uh, do a <laughs> probably a better job than i did um but 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 by way of introduction, there's there's Estonia Polara, who is uh, my uh, right hand man, left hand man, and you know, he 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 he's the guy who keeps the group the group working. So thank you, Tony, for all of that. And we have a bunch of students here, including some undergraduate students uh, like uh, like Jake. We have a postgraduate student, uh, Mirko, who started recently. We have a PhD student of uh, mine, Carl, who's almost at the end of his of his uh, of his studies. Um, and um, yeah, there's a few other pe people here, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to uh, sit around and ask a question. So I'm going to stay here. I'm going to um, be listening to all of us and all these talks. And um, I just want to thank you for, for, for joining us today. So thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Andre. Thank you for your uh, very uh, nice uh, um, talk. And uh, uh, I am Tony Apollaro, and as uh, Andre said, uh, I may be the left hand probably, but as uh, you all know, uh, Andre Fuereb is the head, say, and the brain of the um, uh, of our group. So um, I will now make my short introduction about uh, quantum mechanics. I am sharing the um, screen. And uh, probably, I, be, uh, uh, I beg your pardon, it will be slightly more technical uh, than uh, um, Andre's uh, uh, excellent uh, talk. So, uh, I... perhaps we can introduce the title of your next talk, uh, Tony. Um, so, you will, uh, the title of your next talk is An Identicate of Planck's Constant H. Um, and Dr. Tony Apollo is also a senior lecturer at the Department of Physics, and as we got to know, left hand of uh, Prof. Schwierhefs. <laughs> and right hand, both. And both. right hand and hand, and, and apparently you're the head of the department. Thank you so. Give the floor to Dr. Tony Apollaro. Thank you very much. You should see the um, slides, right? Yes, thank you very much. So, um, here, you can see uh, that this event on the 14th of April has been chosen because uh, it is all about uh, this letter H. H is uh, uh, the Planck constant and its first uh, numbers are 4.14 uh, in electron volts per second. But uh, what is important is that this day has been chosen because uh, April 4, 14 uh, today. So here you can see on the uh, left the program in Malta. So uh, I will be followed by Karl, Mirko, Jake, and then there will be a question and answer session, which eventually can also last longer than uh, uh, just 10 minutes. And we are part of a worldwide effort to celebrate this day with uh, some excellent uh, uh, renowned uh, uh, speakers, and please check the program at this uh, uh, link. Now, we will make a short uh, travel through the reality. 
So we will go from the classical reality of microscopic uh, objects that surround us from planets to uh, football uh, balls, like Andre said, to the quantum domain, where, broadly speaking, we describe the uh, behavior of small or microscopic uh, particles from photons, electrons, atoms, and so on. And we will start with showing an experiment. Now, we will focus, so the experiment would be really uh, 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 made with uh, lasers, there are a lot of optical components. We will not get into the details of this experiment uh, and the experimental setup, but we will get a, a scheme. So, it's similar to the uh, double slit experiment. Suppose we have a laser that emits single photons. Now, a photon is a, actually a particle of light, or better, it is a quantum of light, an indivisible particle. Now, uh, you can do it with uh, this uh, experiment uh, with photons, but you can do it also with electrons, with atoms, uh, and the people are even trying to do it with viruses, by the way. So, suppose we have a laser that emits one, only one photon at a time, or say one atom at a time, and uh, it goes uh, through uh, uh, semi-reflective mirror, this BS, it stands for beam splitter. What happens if I put, uh, say, a detector on uh, the green path and another one on the red path, by sending a photon, it will be detected or by D1 or by D2. So we can say that if I send 100 atoms, uh, one at each time, 50 will be detected by D1 and 50 will be detected by D2. Now, let's uh, make it a bit more, um, elaborate this experiment. We add two mirrors. So a mirror, whatever uh, gets to the mirror will be reflected. So again, I put these two detectors, one here and one here. One can uh, safely say that if we use 100 uh, atoms, 50 will be detected by D1 and 50 will be detected by D2, because 50 come out from follow the red path, 50 would, one could say follow the green path, then they are reflected and so on. Now we add another semi-reflective mirror. So another object that is exactly like this, a beam splitter. And we ask ourselves, and these are experiments really done, how many photons, electrons, or atoms will be detected by the green and how many by the red detector? Now, I can leave you five seconds, 10 seconds, just to think a bit about it. But one could say, well, if 50 go this way and 50 go this way, then here of those 50, 25 go this way, 25 this, and the same uh, for the red path, one could say, well, it should be 50 detected by the green and 50 detected by the red detector. But when you do this experiment, you find out that all of them are detected by the green detector. So one could say, ah, but how is this possible? We will come to this with a quick uh, um, explanation and why this is related to Planck constant. But let's first make a second experiment. It's a virtual experiment. Now, every object, every physical system has some properties. Say it can have mass, it can have length, uh, it can have electric charge, whatever. Now, suppose we take a, a, a physical system and we model it by a card. So this card can have color that can be or red or blue, and then on the other side, the face, it can be a figure or a number. Now let's suppose we make an experiment with 
particles that we model by cards. And we have a bunch of these card playing cards. What we do, we separate the blue from the red cards first. Then we put the red cards aside and we take only the blue ones. So in my hand, I hold only blue cards. Then I turn the cards and I see that they can have a number or a face. A king, I ace, three, six. And what we do, we put the face cards aside and we take only the numbered one. So now the question is, if I turn the cards which I, I'm holding in my hands, what's their color? Now again, five seconds thinking of it. I, I took the blue ones and then I turned them. Then I, of these blue ones, I took the uh, um, numbered one. So if I turn them, they should be blue. But if I make the experiment, we see that they will be, half of them will be blue and half of them will be red. So uh, I know it's quick uh, uh, illustration and uh, probably it's a, a metaphor, but this is what happens in the microscopic world. These kinds of experiments are performed and the weirdness of quantum mechanics was well aware already to its founding founders. So we have uh, uh, sentences or aphorisms like quantum mechanics makes absolutely no sense or other in which Schrodinger uh, said he was, he regretted to have had anything to do with quantum mechanics. Now, uh, these defeats and challenges are a common understanding. And this is due to two principles. One that has been already illustrated some, to some extent, by uh, Andre Schwereb, and it's the wave particle duality. And here is our first encounter with age, Planck constant. We have that a system is at the same time both a wave and a particle. And when you make an experiment, you decide, depending on what you measure, if you want to measure wave-like or particle-like uh, uh, behavior. So every object is a wave and a particle. And this formula, that means that a quantity called momentum is something related to a particle, mass times velocity. Here we have wave behavior, so the wavelength, and we have that their product is equal to Planck constant. So somehow, similarly to Einstein's celebrated formula, E equal to mc squared, where the energy is equal to the mass with this constant that is the speed of light, in quantum mechanics, H is a constant that relates different physical properties, different physical qualities, wave-like and particle-like behavior. Of course, this age is a very, very, very small number. Uh, and so for microscopic objects, the your wavelength associated is very small. And say, if I go to a, a door, I do not diffract, fortunately. <laughs> so the second experiment can be explained with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, saying that it is impossible at the same time to determine position and momentum. They are quantities like the color of the cards and the uh, uh, number of the cards that cannot be determined at the same time. So if I measure a property like the color, I change the number of the other side. If I measure, so I turn the card and measure, so I look at the number, I change the color on the other side. And again, this principle, how much 
you change the properties of something is related to this formula. So the uncertainty in a measurement of the position times the uncertainty in the measurement of the momentum cannot be equal to zero, has to be greater to a quantity that again is Planck constant. So Planck constant is the fundamental limit by which we can know something. Now, all this 100 years later, these strange properties brought along teleportation. Teleportation has been performed with, by uh, teleportation of an atom has been performed. Then it brings a quantum cryptography using cryptography for um, sharing uh, secrets. Then quantum computation and uh, uh, Mirko and uh, uh, Jake uh, uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, and it's very used, very, uh, a, a very big field now in um, uh, to use quantum technologies, both for uh, sensing, uh, both for uh, medical um, investigations, and for uh, finance market analysis. And uh, say we had also uh, uh, tweets by US administration when they announced the um, achievement of quantum uh, supremacy. Of which uh, we'll uh, um, talk Mirko about. Then cryptography, again, is another property based quantum geography on Heisenberg indetermination principle. All the messages we use uh, are encrypted. Many of them are encrypted, and it is uh, difficult to break that encryption because of a mathematical improbability to find the key, the decrypting key. But quantum cryptography is based on the physical impossibility because of Heisenberg indetermination principle. So here we can have a short look at how an, a, 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 a quantum computer looks from outside, this kind of uh, uh, water boiler. And here's the inside. Finally, uh, quantum cryptography has gone to space. Uh, recently, uh, um, satellites have been sent in space. And the quantum cryptography keys were exchanged between China and uh, um, Austria. And Ma uh, Europe, Teresa and Malta is in it, is in a quantum flagship where more than one billion of euro has been invested in research of technological applications of uh, um, quantum mechanics. And uh, 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 this flagship will last for 10 years. So it's a really a good time to investigate uh, uh, quantum mechanics and its uh, um, applications. So with this, uh, I will uh, 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 stop my talk and I will give the word to uh, Karl Pelka, who will talk about uh, uh, light quanta and numbers. Thank you very much. And we are always available, of course, uh, for the question and um, answer session at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. So now we are going to have Karl Andreas Perka, as uh, uh, Prof. Shreira has already mentioned, he's a PhD student in his final stages of his uh, doctoral research. And he will be talking about what light quanta know about numbers. The floor is yours, Kari. Hello, everyone. So can you hear me? Uh, we have a feedback. You have feedback, yes. Do we still have feedback? Yes. Tony, can you mute yourself? Yes, yeah, so switch off the, the volume as well. So mute the audio, Tony, completely. Uh, OK, let, let's try another time. Hello. It's it's nice. Hello. You guys are performing Good. wave wave physics yeah. uh, live <laughs> in real time. We could have seen yeah, the... live feedback. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm even moving on on that. And I'm really happy that uh, both Tony and Andre introduced most of the stuff that I wanted to talk about. So it makes my talk quicker. So let me share my screen. You should be able to see it now, right? Do you see my mouse pointer? Okay, great. So yeah, I want to tell you an extraordinary tale about light quanta. And we heard a lot of them by, by now. And I will tell you something which I really found shocking when I found it out. Namely that they attended math class although there were no math class by the time they were invented. So, but first we need to understand how we can generate or what we can do with light quanta. And there's, so there's a few basic processes which I want to talk about. We heard already that, um, yeah, so quanta can be a quanta of light, but they can also be electrons or atoms. And with, uh, I want to talk about the processes that photons or the light quanta can, um, yeah, can produce in an atom, namely a photon, which is described by this wiggly wave. It can be absorbed by an, by an atom, which we here describe as a nucleus and electrons and orbits, but okay, let's stick to that model by now. Uh, the, the point is that the energy can be absorbed and the elect electron hops from a low energy orbit into a high energy orbit. And this is only possible uh, if the energy is conserved. But then we can also have the uh, inverse process, namely if we have an excited electron in an atom, it can uh, yeah, go into a lower energy state where, uh, whereby it emits uh, a photon of this exact energy. Okay, and then there's a very peculiar process, namely the stimulated emission process where uh, we have an excited atom. So we have this electron with excess energy and we send in another photon or we send in a photon and somehow it manages to kick out the electron into the lower orbit and with that, it reproduces itself. So these two photons, as you can see, they are identical. They look, they look identical here. And in fact, they are identical. And with this, we can do something very yeah, amazing, which we have nowadays every day in our hands. Can you, you see my camera? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so, so we have these laser pointers around every like in everyday life to do presentations and a post uh, in a pre COVID world. But um, so how these work is we have two mirrors and we have some medium which contains these atoms which can be excited. So once they are excited, um, there is the, the possibility or at one point one of these excited atoms will, uh, yeah, will emit one photon via stimulated emission and uh, via, via uh, spontaneous emission. However, this will start an avalanche. So this first photon will start like the simulated emission with another uh, atom. And with that, we, we can imagine the avalanche happening. And because we have it uh, encapsulated in two mirrors, the, the photons go back and forth and they multiply. However, if this mirror is only partly reflecting, some of the photons go out. And with that, we have, uh, yeah, like, uh, light coming out as we have in our laser pointer. So, and the cool thing about it is that all the light that is uh, going out of this uh, mirror, it is, as we said, so all these photons are identical and this is something that uh, is called the, the waves line up in phase or they are coherent. Yeah, and one tiny uh, bit, because I gave the talk or I presented the talk to, uh, to yeah, non-physicists and they didn't know that laser is actually an acronym. So I say it for completeness sake. So light amplification, uh, amplification through stimulated emission of radiation. That's how the name comes about. And also this is the part which Andre basically already told me or told for you. So with these waves, so if they, the waves are coherent, um, probably Malta, the, the waves that you are most familiar with are water waves. And there I found this nice, yeah, gif of like excitation here. And you see that the, uh, here all the water molecules, they line up perfectly in phase and we have, we can start a water wave. And since you are familiar with water waves, you can imagine what happens if you are 
the so if you are located in such a water wave, namely you are the red dot here, you will be wiggled up and down, right? So you will feel that energy is put into you as a system. So you will be wiggled and you feel it. All right. So what can we do with the light ana analogon of this? So actually I wanted to present it to you in the lab, but this is not possible because of the construction today. Um, anyhow, we have a laser pointer and we can uh, make it pass through a slit, like the laser pointer I'm having here. And as Andre already told you, if water passes towards a slit, uh, it will, if they, if they arrive as with a, yeah, with a wave front like this, they will be turned into circular waves. And that was also a very nice feature of Andre's talk because I didn't think that it is like something natural for people around here. For me, it's not. Okay, so let's make the uh, animation. Don't be irritated by the, play bar down there. And you can see that here in the middle, the, the contrast is very large. So if you were to sit here, you would be wiggled around a lot. Whereas here you see that the contrast is not that big. So here you wouldn't be wiggled around as much. And this is so to say the, the intensity pattern, how hardly you would be wiggled around if you were placed somewhere. Don't be irritated that the picture is upside down. I computed it actually from top to bottom, having this slit here. Um, but we see something peculiar around here. We see weird patterns here and like very close to the slit. And if we zoom in even harder, we, we can see that there is something interesting, uh, interesting happening here. And we can even go further. We can see uh, what happens with the two slits and already under also showed it to you. Again, we have circular waves emitted from the two slits and you would be wiggled around pretty hard in the middle. And then there are fringes where you, no energy would be exerted or would be put into you. All right. And so what I did uh, before I came to Malta, I in investigated what happened, what would happen, if, well, what happens if you have many, many of those slits and how the intensity pattern looks like. And in fact, in the near field, it takes on this very you know, nice shape. I mean, it is a very regular shape. You have these, this nice carpet-like structure. They are even called Talbot carpets. And what I want to uh, want you to focus on is, so these are, yeah, we can, uh, so here is, uh, say, the slit. And as you see, uh, I want you to follow what happens with the intensity along this line. So we start off where a slit is, and we just follow what's happening there. And we will see that on a like vertical or parallel to it, we will see a lot of things happening. So actually I have a video of this and I will uh, mark one of these slits for you. So follow maybe what's happening around the, the mouse cursor. Uh, I warn you ahead of time, once I start the video, the cursor will disappear, but I will make it reappear. So we see this, uh, yeah very, yeah, how would you call it? It's uh, so we, uh, we see this, the, the slits appearing in different periodicities and it's, so now we have the original uh, periodicity, but we saw that it was not where the mouse cursor is placed, but we have this uh, well, nice reappearance. I find it somehow meditative. <laughs> We're almost there. So in, if you look closely now, it is the same periodicity that we had in the beginning. So there is just the light and it's just hitting this grating and there's no other optics involved apart from camera, the camera taking the picture. And, and it, so it's self, yeah, it's self-focusing, right? So we have the slit and after some distance, it's, uh, we see the same picture again. And the fun, uh, the very interesting part, which I found shocking is if we look at the intensity along this line, which I showed you with the mouse pointer, we can look at the intensity and we see that uh, 
yeah, there are certain points where it's larger and uh, there are certain points where it's smaller. However, if we take this distance and we divide it up into say 27 equidistant distances and we look at the intensity, there is something very peculiar. If we, um, yeah, if we connect the first and the last dot and we look which of the dots are above the line, it is exactly three and nine. Don't be um, yeah, irritated by this dot. It's just the key of this figure. And so this is actually no, uh, no coincidence. The light field behind this grating is made out, uh, knows about prime number, uh, yeah, prime, prime numbers. We here see actually the prime number decomposition of 27. And to me, this is something really remarkable because who told the grating something about numbers? The, neither the grating nor the photons ever attended a math class, but that's the way it is. Um, yeah, so that's the interesting thing I wanted to tell you about many photons, but this, uh, so already Tony told you about um, yeah, quantum key cryptography or quantum key distribution. And also I want to point you to a nice didactic experiment that Tony and I uh, conducted. And this is this part of the optical table. And because time is up, uh, I want to point you to our YouTube video on that. So uh, you can also look for EQW 2020 Malta secret quantum conversation and you will find it there. Or you can also read up on the paper about the Talbot effect. It's open access so everyone can look at it. So with that, I'm done. Thank you, Carl, for that very interesting take of uh, what light quantum uh, um, know about, about numbers. So now we are going to have another PhD student, this time Mirko Consilio, who will talk about the road to quantum supremacy. It sounds very huge, <laughs> supremacy, something, something great. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of what you are going to discuss, Mirko. The floor is yours. So just to confirm, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Let me start. Okay. So, as you already know, I'm a PhD student uh, at the University of Malta under the supervision of Dr. Tony Apollara. And today I will be talking about a particular concept known as the road to um, quantum supremacy. So, before we start on describing what quantum supremacy is, I want you to, to know a little bit about how quantum computers work. Now, to compare this, uh, to, to make a simple comparison with how a normal computer works, like your desktop computer or your laptop, they work by operating on what is known as bits. Now, bits are essentially um, states in a, in, a, in a circuit which can be represented by either on or off, electricity flowing or not, true or false, or simply by looking at zeros and ones, which is what your computer understands. Now, when we go to a quantum computer, there is, um, there is also this idea of representing two states, either being a zero or a one. However, what a qubit is, or a quantum bit, is that it's capable of accessing states which are not only zero or one, but they are both at the same time. Now, already um, Dr. Anders Schwirap has alluded to this idea by considering what is known as superposition, where they consider, for example, light waves interacting with, with each other or even other atoms, such as, for example, the, the football going uh, to two places at the same time. Now, this is where the power of quantum computing, quantum computing comes from. And essentially, why should we consider now investing in these quantum technologies? Well, if we consider, for example, uh, one qubit, we can access many more states than a normal bit can. And in fact, this idea, if we continue onwards to two, three, four, or more qubits, we can find that we can uh, usually incorporate this into quantum computers to achieve an, what is known as an exponential speed up, meaning that we can essentially simulate or even um, run quantum algorithms that are much, much faster than you would on a normal uh, computer. 
For example, if we had a 50 qubit quantum computer, then this would already be able to achieve most of the stuff that, uh, that one of the best supercomputers in the world can achieve. For our example, if we were to able to go up to 300 qubits, then there are enough states that um, there are more states than there are atoms in the entire universe. And this can give you an idea to how powerful a quantum computer can be in the long run. Now, a little bit of the inner workings of a quantum computer can be compared to how a normal computer works, where in, in a normal computer, your circuits, your, your motherboard, your graphics card work by incorporating what are known as logic circuits, which essentially take these binary digits, these bits, and operate on them to essentially perform some sort of computation. Like, for example, the top circuit represents the simple addition of two numbers. A quantum circuit, on the other hand, is, is a particular analogy that we make to logic circuits, where quant most quantum computers are programmed in the same way exactly, but instead using quantum gates to operate on these qubits. And we use this idea to perform universal quantum computation, that is, trying to extend certain algorithms which are very hard to simulate or even compute on a normal computer. And so, I arrive to my main point. What is exactly this idea of quantum supremacy? And quantum supremacy essentially can be explained in such that the, it is the point when a quantum computer is able to carry out an algorithm which is essentially intractable on a normal computer. By intractable, I mean that this is not feasible. It is not, it is not efficient to simulate on a classical computer. And we already know that certain systems on a classical computer are not able to be simulated, are not able to simulate quantum um, systems efficiently. However, we have one problem that we are facing currently nowadays in the quantum technological market. And essentially that is, we are in the era of noisy intermediate scale quantum devices or NISC for short. By intermediate scale, we mean that we can build quantum computers that range from about 50 to 100 qubits. However, these qubits are inherently noisy. By noisy, I mean that they are prone to errors. And this is due to how um, we control our qubits. There is still a lot of research that is needed to be done on, to, on how to efficiently control them to perform our quantum algorithms efficiently. Now, how are we achieving this quantum supremacy, the point where we are able to overcome the classical barrier of algorithms? First things first is that in 2019, so just two years ago, Google published this um, paper on generating certifiable random numbers using their 54 qubit quantum processor called Sycamore. And essentially they showed um, an instance of quantum supremacy being achieved in that we have an exponential increase in the speed of generating pure random numbers not pseudo random that you would find in a normal computer, but actually random. And they found that this would take a couple of minutes on a normal, on, on, a, on their quantum computer, but it would possibly take even years on a, on a classical computer to be able to verify the solution that we achieve by this algorithm. Apart from this, recently there has also been another instance of um, signifying quantum supremacy, and that is by the USTC Zhushang quantum um, photonic quantum computer, which similarly works by light waves, as for example, um, Carl discussed, and that it, it treats a problem in the, in the physics areas known as boson samplings, or rather than bosons, we can consider them to be light waves, photons essentially. And this all, they also showed that, that uh, a certain um, algorithm can be achieved in a matter of minutes, whereby on a quantum, on a, excuse me, on a normal computer, it would take even millions or billions of years to be able to achieve this kind of speed. And now you can see the power that we can achieve by these quantum computers. So what's the next step? What can we do with these? Well, one significant application and one hopefully upcoming way of showing and truly achieving this uh, era of quantum advantage is Shor's algorithm. 
Now over here, I'm not really showing you anything apart from uh, like a blueprint of the circuit that we would need to run on a normal quantum computer. However, what is amazing about this algorithm is that it is able to find factors of any number that is um, essentially numbers which are able to divide the prime numbers which are able to divide the really large um, number by using um, uh, quantum computers. And this can be used, for example, to even crack really hard crypto systems, such as what your banks use to encode your data. Now, I'm not saying that in the future we'll be able to just, you know, steal all your money from the bank, but this paves the way forward to using this sort of algorithm to even tackle really hard mathematical and computer problems. And essentially, this is what we are looking forward in the next era of quantum computers, where we are able to increase the scale of the qubits that we are able to use and also reduce the errors that are kind, kind, um, currently present in a normal quantum computer. So you can see that this is heralding a new era of quantum supremacy. So I thank you for um, attending this talk and also the World Quantum Day in general. And if you have any questions, I'll be available at the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mirko, for that very interesting talks about co quantum computer. And following your presentation, we will now have our last student. He is uh, currently an undergraduate student uh, following a course in math and physics at the Department of Physics and Mathematics, of course. And he will be talking about quantum pastizzi, quantum computing with multi streets. So I'll give the floor to, um, to Jake Schwere. Right. Um, can can everyone hear me and and uh, see um, the the screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Just, okay. Great. Right. So let's get started, guys. Um, so uh, perhaps really, I'm, I'm I made a bit of a bet, right? I, I didn't really know what the other guys were were going to present to you, um, but I I thought that you know we'd have some perhaps more hardcore talks uh, where where sort of quantum computation is, is really uh, outlined, outlined thoroughly, like by Mirko and, and Tony. And I thought we'd also get maybe the basics of, of what quantum computing or quantum mechanics does um, from a bit of a, of a sky view. And my bet uh, paid off, thankfully. Uh, so what I wanted to do was to then maybe say a bit of a small story um, about, you know, taking these ideas to their extremes um, and trying to think through them, right? And, and to take these really foundational concepts like superposition, entanglement, and measurement, and to try and see what, what the implication would be in, in real life. So what, what are pastizzi uh, first off? And then we'll use them to talk about what quantum mechanics is, right? Um, so let's go here. Um, great, so pastizzi are these, these, these multis baked treats um, the literal translation is uh, pea cakes on the right, so pastizzi tal piselli, pea cakes on the right, and uh, pastizzi tal ricotta on the left, which are these um, uh, 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 cheesecakes. I think cake is a really bad word here. They're much more like a croissant, so even uh, the way you, you bake them is a lot like uh, croissants for you people that might be interested in, in how to, to bake things. Um, and they're this really famous uh, hangover post-party treat because this particular shop in, in Rabat in Malta is open 24 hours um, a day. And it's really famous that like after a night of partying at four in the morning, you wind up here and you have some pastizzi and, and sort of a, a cup of tea and you come to your senses a bit before you go home uh, to get a stern talking to from your mother. But now let's try to make this a bit of a more quantum situation, right? Maybe Serkin, um, that's the name of this pastiche shop, um, is having some trouble, right? A lot of drunk people are showing up and they don't know what to order. They take too long to order and they never know what they want. So maybe they're like, okay, you know, we made so much money in the past 10 years, we made millions, let's buy a quantum computer that's going to help us distribute pastiche. Um, so, so this quantum computer can start to do things like, like uh, Mirko was talking about, particularly this, this randomness aspect, right? Um, so let's start to, to examine these things a bit, and I'm going to pose a question here. So imagine 
that Serkin have bought this quantum computer and, and they're starting to, to do this thing where they're distributing Pastetsi quantumly. And you and your friend show up there and you're in the car and you're sitting there and you tell your friend, go and buy four of whatever you want for me. And your, your friend buys four for himself and four for you. Before you open the bags, right? Before you open your bag and before you also open um, the friend's bag, how do you, how can you tell what is in the bag beforehand, right? So we want to kind of make a guess about what the, the pastizzi in the bags are, right? And they can be, of course, Ercotta or, or Pizzelli in this case. Um, so let's, let's try to talk through this. So the existence of superposition states and the phenomenon of measurement, as Mirko was kind of showing you, uh, classical systems can be in one of two places, right? They have uh, the basis state zero or one, but um, in our picture, right, we have our Costa or Pizzelli, right, this binary case. Mirko also explained that uh, we have this thing called the Bloch sphere and computations occur on the Bloch sphere, right, and you can have these mixes of, uh, of Ercotta and Pizzelli, and this is really also what Andre and, and Tony were uh, speaking about when they were talking about interference, and even Carl, right, with his Talbot carpet. Um, we can use interference before the computation in the way we are preparing the plasticity. So our baker is there, and maybe he's using this quantum computer to distribute uh, these plasticity differently. And what, what, what um, does uh, what he's doing, what effect does it have on the outcome, right? This is really what we're interested in, because ultimately, we're still going to get plasticity um, of uh, Ercotta or Pizzelli, right? We're not going to get some sort of weird mixed pastits because that's not how the real world works. So we have to transition from this mixed place, this, this sort of probability space to, to this classical real world space. And this is where the interference and the measurement comes in, right? So what happens is that this baker now with access to this quantum computer can affect the probability of the outcome that you're going to get. So this baker can prepare the plasticity in such a way in his oven with this quantum computer that maybe it's much more likely that you get Ercotta in your bag, or maybe it's much more likely that you get Pizzelli, or maybe it's, it's precisely 50% likely that you get Ercotta or 50% likely that you get Pizzelli. And this is really the quantumness, right? Beforehand, if we think about what the baker could have done before, all he could have done is always give you certain probability, right? He can always give you, okay, you're either going to get Ercotta or you're going to get Pastic for each Pastic you have. But in this situation, uh, the superposition, the interference is empowering this baker to make uh, the distribution, the, the, the choices of Pastic a bit more interesting. He's saying that now, uh, our probabilities are going to change. And that's what happens when you open the bag and you measure in quantum terms, right? Those probabilities now turn into actual realities and you witness what's in the bag. So that's really what superposition and interference do, right? Yes, in quantum mechanics, we examine them in their own right mathematically, but pragmatically, they're just probabilities and they're going to affect the outcome of what happens when you open the bag. So that's kind of this, this intuition. Uh, I'd like you guys to have. The next one is entanglement. So you and your friend both got these bags of pastizzi. And these pastizzi, since you arrived at the shop together and, and, and all these things were baked at the same time in this oven, right? And this oven, maybe it has some sort of structure to it, right? So maybe Pizzelli all are made on the same uh, level of the oven. Um, and their cotta are all made on the same level of the oven, and maybe your friend's pastizzi and yours were placed in the same uh, place in the oven. What does that mean? That means that when you, before you even open the bag, you can make certain statements about your bag, before, given that your friend opens your bag, his bag before yours. So stuff like crunchiness, for example, if you bought your pastizzi at the same time, and they were made in the oven together, then you, by observing what your friend has seen when he opens his, his bag and takes the first bite, um, if, if his pastitsu were very crunchy, you can start to assume that yours must be crunchy also because they were made in the same oven. 
so it, it kind of makes sense that these systems are correlated, we would say, right? They are, they are somehow related. By knowing what is happening in your friend's bag, you can start to make statements about your own bag. And this is all coming from the structure of the oven, right? So the system overall, what's happening in this oven is predetermining what the states after can do. This is really what entanglement is about. Entanglement is about having this information structure and then afterwards uh, seeing the repercussion of this information structure um, maybe in, in, in separate subsystems. And in this specific case, we can even try and determine, right, what pastitsi we're going to have. So if, for example, all the pastitsi in, in the first row are piselli and all the pastitsi in the second row are ricotta, and you notice that you see the baker reaching for the top more than you see him reaching for the bottom, you can be certain that just by observing your friend's bag and seeing that distribution of having more piselli, for example, and more and, and lesser cotta, you can start to make um, statements about what's in your bag just by knowing what the structure of the oven was like. So again, just to summarize this point, uh, finally, entanglement is about this correlation which is, is created between subsystems. And this correlation happens because um, they for, these subsystems form part of a larger system. In this analogy, we're talking about these pastitsi that are in this oven together. And because they've been in this oven together, they have to be related somehow, right? Like how crunchy they're going to be is going to be similar because they experience the same type of heat, for example. And this is how entanglement arises in quantum systems because we have our qubits and sort of, let's say we, we carry out a series of gates on these qubits and they perform operations on the qubits together, then they must be related. And we really, really make use of this characteristic, of this resource of entanglement um, within quantum algorithms. So the answer, right, if you wanted to try, and, and this is one of these cute people that used to work um, at this pastitsi shop where you'd rock up at four in the morning. Um, so it, to the answer to the question, how do you guess what's in your bag beforehand is talk to the baker talk to the baker about his oven, talk to the baker about the distribution. Why? This is going to tell us what the quantum state of the pastitsi is going to be in. And knowing the quantum state, we're going to know the interference, we're going to know the superposition, so we know what the probabilities are, right? We know how the probabilities are distributed, we know if, whether it's more likely to get Piselli, whether it's more likely to get Ricotta, for example. We know these things because we, he knows the state, right? He's prepared the state using his quantum computer. And he can also tell us about the structure of the oven, which would tell us about the entanglement structure of our pastitsi before we open our bags. Um, that's everything I have to say, guys. I hope it was as entertaining for you um, as it was for me to make this talk. You know, I tried to make sort of a, a funny, um, a silly talk. Um, I'd like to thank you all for, for attending because it's really cool to see so many people excited about, about quantum mechanics, which is something I'm very excited about. And I'd like to thank all the other uh, speakers who spoke before me for their enthusiasm. So, so thank you guys. Thank you, Mirko. And thank you everyone for all your brilliant talks about quantum. So uh, I, I honestly could never think about entanglement and, and pastitsi, but it was a very entertaining talk, I must say, Jake. Uh, Tony, the floor is yours to moderate the discussion session. We can't hear you. Maybe you have to raise the volume of your mic. Okay, now it should be okay, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much to all the speakers, to um, Jake that uh, made me come a lot of uh, uh, desire for uh, a pastizzi and uh, quantum mechanics as well. And uh, um, I will um, moderate the discussion. The, uh, so you are invited to unmute yourself and say intervene both with comments, uh, observations, uh, uh, questions. Uh, of course, uh, I, uh, don't 
don't give it for granted that we are able to answer to all the questions clearly. <laughs> so I would like to uh, see if there is room for uh, discussion, uh, both uh, on the content of our talks and on quantum mechanics in general, and, uh, uh, and also uh, about uh, um, communication dissemination, because I want to thank Daniel Farugia for the great work in organizing uh, this event. And uh, you all should also thank her because uh, thanks to her, our talks uh, were less uh, technical than to we were thinking at the beginning and less, much less equations. Of course, uh, should we not have been uh, able to uh, bring to the messages all uh, fault of the speakers? Uh, so please, uh, uh, you can also chat. Uh, right in the chat uh, if uh, uh, you have uh, um, uh, you want to intervene with some comment in the meantime i would also like to uh, tell you that if you want to get to know more about our events at the, at the department you can sign up to our mailing list um, and you will get to know about our future events as well. So if you are interested, you can send me an email. Um, Prof. Europe has already put my email in the chat, but I can write it down again, and you can send me an email to sign up to our mailing list. So if you want to ask a question, just uh, switch on your, um, either unmute yourself or you can write it in the chat. I understand that probably we went a bit uh, uh, out of time and uh, uh, say, but it's due to the um, energy uh, time uncertainty relation. So it's very difficult uh, to be exact. It's impossible for, for a quantum physicist to be exactly on time because the concept of exactly on time does not exist in quantum mechanics. <laughs> so. Um, should there be no uh, questions, we are always available, of course. And please visit the website for the, um, we can put it in the chat again eventually, for the uh, events that will be taking place uh, all this day. Then, of course, uh, uh, don't wait for 14th of April of 2022 to uh, get interested again about quantum mechanics. We will uh, um, have a couple of events throughout the year, also with uh, um, the European quantum flagship. For instance, some of the, of the events that were presented by Carl. And by the way, I see um, a question uh, on the chat or more than one question. So uh, let's uh, start with the first one that I think it's uh, by Katerina and uh, um, she asks, uh, well, do you see the question in the chat, Karl? Okay, so please, uh, her question is uh, uh, about the quanta that know the prime numbers. So do you know or have you wondered why this peculiar phenomenon happens? Yes, I. So I think I can talk. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, no, there is no feedback loop. Um, to be honest, so the maths say so, <laughs> and it's it was really um, yeah, it was astonishing. It was shocking to me that we find. Uh, Informate well, that light has information about prime numbers because, as I told you, they never attended any maths class, right? And I, I mean, the physics say so, and it's a very general wave phenomenon. So it works for the for the like for the uh, football, like the atom footballs, the buckyballs that Andre said in the beginning. The same works for electrons. It has been shown in electrons. Um, this is how nature works, and that's also part, like, that's, this is why it's fun to be a physicist. You find out stuff which is phenomenal. That's what I can say to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the question to Katrina and uh, um, to 
who called for the answer, to, to which I agree in some sense, many results of quantum mechanics are derived via, via mathematical formalism and their interpretation is not easy. Actually, it's not unique. There are so many interpretations of quantum mechanics, starting from the measurement problem uh, illustrated by Jake. There are uh, interpretations uh, saying that there exists uh, many universes. Every time you make a measurement, a new universe, a complete new universe pops up. So, uh, say, um, it's every time interesting to uh, uh, wonder about and question the deep uh, meanings, but then it's uh, difficult, uh, say, to uh, make it concile with uh, what is our common understanding and our, say, paradox, uh, our common opinion. Now, let's go to the next question by Parth Gupta, and uh, it's a very interesting question, and uh, it, uh, it's a question in which uh, which contains already the answer somehow. It is, uh, isn't almost everything entangled? Uh, for instance, uh, potential energy increases, kinetic energy decreases and vice versa. Any change in one energy changes automatically. So must it not be entangled? This is a very deep uh, uh, question. And I uh, also believe that it comes uh, from uh, a physicist or someone who is uh, very knowledgeable in physics, because uh, uh, he relates, uh, he mentions the principle of conservation of energy in this case. So for a closed system, without going into details, energy is conserved. So if something decreases, some, something else increases, and one could say, is entanglement related to something like this? For instance, if I have a uh, uh, hundred, uh, uh, I don't know, um, cards, uh, like cards, <laughs> hundred cards, uh, and uh, I, 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 I make uh, two bunches, uh, then if one is 41, then the other bunch of cards has to be 59, because uh, there is a quantity that is conserved. This is very interesting, but entanglement is something more than this, because uh, correlations exist also in the classical world, clearly, but these correlations have an upper limit. There is a known, uh, for physicists, a theorem that's called the Bell's theorem that Classical correlations based on concepts like principle of conservation of energy, principle of conservation of angular momentum, of total momentum, and so on, cannot exceed a certain quantity. Now, it is interesting, it's also here age bar comes in, age, the uh, Planck constant, because age fixes the upper limit for quantum correlations. So quantum correlations are stronger than classical correlations. It's true that the two particles have to interact, like Jack said, but the correlations that are established are non-local first and stronger than classical ones. Now, I don't want to dive into what non-local correlations are, but somehow it has been already said by Jake that when two particles get entangled, they become like one particle, independently of where they are. I could have a particle here and another one, say, on the moon, if they are entangled, whatever I do here has an immediate effect on the other entangled particle on the moon. Now, 
uh, if someone wants to add uh, uh, someone else, also of the public, because I see names in the public that are uh, actually colleagues, scientists from uh, other countries. So please add. Uh, I'd make a, a small please. comment here that's please very ahead, almost shocking to me. Entanglement in quantum mechanics is more common than not having entanglement. Um, so if you look at uh, in quantum mechanics or in quantum information, often what we do is we have a state and we try to learn things about the state. Or you have the, the space of all the possible states your system can be in. And you try to say things about sort of areas of this state space. And uh, what you see is that entanglement is far more prevalent than, than uh, uh, states which are not entangled and initially this is kind of shocking right because one we do not interact with entanglement um, at our let's say energy scale or at our length scale right it, it is not usual for us to I don't know shake hands with someone and then walk away but we can still read their mind or something like this right we we do not uh, we do not interact with entanglement um, at our length scale um, but in the quantum setting, entanglement is far more prevalent. And this makes sense because there are many more instances where sort of, if you have two particles, like Tony was saying, they're going to have interacted at some point. They're going to have interacted at some point and develop a, a correlation. And there are many more of these states than there are of states where sort of these particles have never spoken to each other. And to me, that's quite, uh, profound, right? Because it means that we have entanglement, which is this very important resource in, in quantum computation, which is very accessible, right? Like you can always get some entanglement in your algorithm and make use of it. Um, and that's, that's very interesting to me. So like this precious resource is actually very available. And so that's the only thing I wanted to add. Thank you, Jake. Now there is um, a question that uh, is very specific uh, and uh, I ask uh, our brilliant minds, uh, uh, Jake uh, and uh, um, uh, Mirko, uh, that mainly work on quantum computing uh, to uh, answer uh, eventually with pastizis uh, this question uh, by Isaac, uh, uh, that is, uh, what are the implications uh, of quantum computing on artificial general intelligence. I, I doubt we can answer it with plasticity, so <laughs> that's a challenge I'm not going to, to try. But sort of maybe let's say, let's start more grounded and then walk into the realm of, of maybe being a bit not that grounded in reality. But so artificial intelligence and sort of machine learning algorithms, if you like, um, are based on what are known as tensor networks. And tensor networks are these large matrices, these large mathematical structures, if you will, these maybe large lists of numbers that are related somehow, structured. These quantum computers help them a lot. So, and Mirko can probably talk better than me about this. When you're multiplying matrices together, these large mathematical objects, quantum computers help you a lot there. So there is this obvious benefit that the maths behind machine learning, the maths behind artificial intelligence is facilitated by uh, a quantum computer. But then secondly, and, and maybe sort of this will come as an afterthought, um, if you're talking about AI, you're inadvertently talking about developing some sort of consciousness at some level, right? And uh, the way that neural architectures work, at least, sort of say in a human, where you have this like storm of electricity in your brain, that's an inherently quantum thing. So maybe you'd, you'd really want a quantum computer to describe that. And we can discuss this more. I'll, I'll give uh, Mirko the chance to comment here. Well, essentially, Jake, you summarized pretty much what I was going to say, but um, uh, just to kind of relay the message maybe a bit simpler, essentially, what you have in an AI, like you said, is this idea of something learning from either 
a simple set of commands that is supplied or from everything that it is able to read from its surroundings. And essentially what, what quantum computers will help is this, like you said, uh, Jake, facilitation of actually improving the learning rate of something of this magnitude. So just for example, if you consider like um, a chess AI, for example, learning the best moves to do in a certain position, you can do that with a normal computer. However, what you can do is incorporate this into a quantum algorithm. And what you would be able to do is, is exploit the capabilities of superposition and entanglement to obtain a significant speed up in the way that it learns. For example, in a couple of minutes of the program, for example, the chess program playing with itself, it could even beat some of the top players in the world. I'm talking about that level of speed up. So this is why this I was talking about this idea of supremacy, meaning that in a matter of minutes, certain algorithms would be able to outscale even the most complicated things we are able to devise on a normal computer. So this is what the, what the implications are on not just um, future artificial intelligence, but other applications such as, for example, crypto systems, even developing new medicines or new materials to use in the future. Thank you, Mirko. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Thank you, Mirko. And uh, it's a, a very a challenge to answer this uh, very um, profound and uh, cross fertilizing uh, um, uh, questions. And indeed, uh, uh, say the Department of Physics uh, is uh, uh, collaborating also with computer science department and with uh, other departments to get to uh, quantum computing and uh, enrich the fields of quantum science and quantum technologies. Now, I would like to um, read a comment more uh, and uh, make a discussion on it, because Ra Masoud Rastgu, I don't know if I pronounce it good, uh, made a very interesting remark saying that it is interesting how Planck's constant has been measured from photoelectric effect experiment and traveled these investigations and showed up its crucial role in quantum science. Now, this is a very interesting point showing where uh, Einstein, when he explained the quantum, uh, uh, the photoelectric effect, he said that uh, energy travels in, uh, of an electromagnetic field, but say energy travels in light quanta. So it's like a currency, like a coin. And the energy is equal to H times the frequency ni. And it's interesting uh, that he builds those up, taking the idea from Planck, which was an idea uh, that he was very reluctant of. When uh, he needed to explain um, an effect called black body radiation, but uh, now without going into details, somehow the classical theories were not matching with the light emitted, say, from the sun, for instance, how the light is distributed with frequency and so on. Now, uh, Planck introduced H, and then it, after what it was named Planck constant, to explain the uh, 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 black body radiation, so this phenomena, and he said it is an act of despair because he was not happy with it. It's interesting how age at the beginning in, uh, of history in 1900, exactly 1900, came out and was proposed more as a, a mathematical trick to get the equation right rather than a real fundamental uh, quantity that then would have a spread everywhere in uh, uh, physics and giving rise to that field called quantum science. So I thank uh, uh, Masoud for pointing uh, uh, it out how this uh, um, number, how this quantity came out and how many meanings one can attach to this uh, uh, quantity. So, uh, 
If there are no other questions, I would, uh, uh, first of all, thank uh, all of the participants again. Uh, thank you also for your great um, interaction and uh, um, communication. We hope uh, next year to be able to do it uh, at a uh, physical place and uh, be able also to have a couple of pastizzis after the, uh, the talks and have, uh, say, communicating uh, um, face to face. With this, uh, I give the last word to who organized all this, Danielle. To... No, actually, you organized all this. <laughs> but it's, we had a brilliant set of talks. And we look forward to having this also as a physical event, but also um, an online hybrid event whereby international guests can also uh, check in um, our, our online event as well. But hopefully we'll be having a, a physical event next year as well. Thank you all for joining. And again, if you would like to uh, join our future events, our future quantum events, you can send us an email to our mailing list to my email, that is. Thank you all for joining. Thank you and happy Quantum Day.